All right, let's pray. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. God, I thank you that you're here. I thank you that you're real. I thank you that you're pursuing every person in this room with your love. And God, I, we give you this time. We're here for you. We're not here just to get together and sing songs. We're here for you, Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would give me the words to say and that you would open every heart no matter where they're at in life, no matter what they're going through, that God, you would speak to them in a way that they would take it out of here, that it would minister to them way after church is over, and that it would bring transformation and draw them closer to you, to your heart, and to their destiny in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so um, I love Wegmans. Any Wegmans fans here? Like, I miss Wegmans. When I was in California, I would think about Wegmans. They got the best subs, the best bread. Like, it makes grocery shopping just a delight. Um, yes, and that was, an, that was a plug for Wegmans, even though I get no compensation for that. Um, I love Wegmans. And so, lots of times when I'm in State College, I just don't have anywhere to go at the moment. Like, I have an appointment in an hour or whatever. So, I go and I hang out at Wegmans. And I was there the other day. And there was this guy there, and I, he had caught my attention a little bit when I walked by, but I sat down, and I was actually working on this sermon, and he, he was talking with his wife or whatever, and they got up to leave, and I just looked up, and I noticed that he had like this massive swelling in his feet, and he was on crutches, and when he stood up, he actually began to weep a little bit because he was in so much pain. Like, you could just see him. He was just standing still and holding, like, holding his eyes. And my heart was breaking for this guy. And I'm working on a sermon. And I'm thinking, I need to pray for this guy. You know? But, like, I am, and I've admitted it before, I'm an introverted guy. It's not my normal mode to walk up to strangers uninvited. It's just not my thing. And so I'm watching this man in agony as I'm sitting at, at my table with my drink and I'm super comfortable. And I just felt the Lord was like, what are you going to do? Like you preach healing. You preach that the living God lives inside of you and that you have a voice of hope and truth to people that are hurting. And here is a guy hurting. Like, you say a lot, what do you really believe? And I felt like there was just no, no question about it. I had to take responsibility for what I said I believed. Like, anybody can say anything at any time, it means nothing. What you do demonstrates what you actually believe. And so I had to, and I, I went up to him, and he was walking out in his crutches, and I just put my hand on his back. I was like, sir, can I help you? And he was so appreciative. He's like, actually, I'm really good. Thank you so much for asking. And, and I said, well, what's going on? And he told me a little bit. And I was like, would it be okay if I prayed for you? And he's like, I pray a lot, but okay. Praise God. That's all I needed. You know, and so we bowed our heads in the Wegman the table's there, and, and I just prayed for him real gently. I blessed him, and he, he was on his way out. So I didn't get to be like, hey, can you test it out or anything? I, but I just, I blessed him. I prayed for him, and he's like, thank you so much for seeing me, for reaching out to me, for praying for me. I'm like, absolutely, man, you know? And he went on his business, and I feel like God is raising up his people to live out what we say we believe, where it goes from just speech to actual action. And so, and it's across the board. I'm not just talking about evangelism or, or ministry like that. That's actually really not where I'm at today. I'm talking about when you are in a situation that you don't know how you got there and you don't know how you're going to get out, where your beliefs actually override your fears and you live out the Christian life in faith and strength when it doesn't look like there's any hope. And so for me personally, you know, I shared before I left 
I just spent the last five weeks in California, if you don't know me or my story, but right before I left, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I got all these invitations and all these opportunities, and I, I don't know which one's right. I don't know which one's going to work out. I don't know what, at that point, I didn't know what state I was going to live in. I just have no, I have no answers to any of my questions. And has anyone ever been there? Give me a wave if you've ever been, okay, I'm talking to the right group of folks today. And so even getting back to California, um, God miraculously got me a place to stay. I may actually talk about that later, but just was just working with me, but still not answering a lot of my questions. I'm like, God, give me something concrete, please. Please. And then the things that he was leading me to, I'm like, like X, Y, and Z need to fall in place before that will work, but they're not falling into place, God. Like, what the heck? And so just in my Bible readings, I kept coming across this word Meribah. And like I would be in like reading on this page and on the left page, it would say Meribah. And then I would be somewhere else and I'd be like, like the waters of Meribah. And after like, you know, God sometimes has to keep hitting me before I realize things. Like maybe you're trying to tell me something. It's at least worth looking up. So I Googled Meribah, like, what is that? And so, if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 17. There's actually two places in the, in the, the narrative of Israel that are called Meribah, and it's almost the exact same story, but in my research, there are two different places, and there's a slight difference in the story. So, Exodus chapter 17. Um, we start, yeah, verse one, one through seven. It says, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according, I'm sorry, according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why are you quarreling with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? And I looked at my life. I'm like, I actually see a little parallel here because this is what the thought that popped into my head when I read that story was, the people need water. They need water. They, like, the, it's a legitimate need that they have. Like, they're not being irrational and going, we're in the desert and we're thirsty and we need water, our children need water, our livestock, we need water. The fact that they wanted water was not the problem. The problem was their heart in waiting for their legitimate need to be met. And I think a lot of us, we have legitimate needs. The things we've been praying for are real. And we're not being, again, irrational in wanting them. We're not like, oh, dude, you're just being ridiculous. You're being dramatic. No, I need water. Like basic necessity of life. But the thing was, they quarreled with God because he wasn't meeting their need in the timing or the way they wanted. And because of that, they hardened their hearts. And so this story is brought up in Psalm chapter 95. We start in, we're starting with verse 7. It says... This is Psalms 95, verse 7. 
For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, or on the day of at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, and they put me to the proof, though they, though they had seen my work. Is that it? No. For 40 years, I loathed this generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they will not enter my rest. And so in reading this Psalms chapter 95, this recount of the experience at Meribah of having a legitimate need that's not being met and getting angry and blaming God and going, I wish we had gone back to Egypt, like three kind of things popped out of me in this, this part. And the first part is, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. If you remember who you are in Christ and who God promises to be to you, it's going to be a lot harder to harden your heart. I think sometimes we forget what our inheritance actually is as the children of God. We forget that the Bible is very clear that he is a good father who loves us who says he knows what we need before we even ask, who promises to never leave us or ever forsake us, who promises a purpose and a future, who Jesus has provided forgiveness and peace and joy and righteousness in his kingdom, and he promises that he will finish the good things that he starts. He is our shepherd, and we are the people of his pasture. If we remember that, we will walk through the things of life a lot more confidently and a lot more triumphantly. The second part is in the hardness of heart. There are times when we get so frustrated with things not being the way we think they should be that we actually allow our hearts to harden toward God. I don't think there's a person on this planet that has never experienced that. But there there has to be a place when you recognize that, that you release it back to him. And God, God never needs, he's never done anything wrong in his life. He has no malice or darkness or shadow in him. But sometimes we hold him accountable for the wrong things that have happened to us. And because of that, we hold unforgiveness toward God and it screws everything else up. Why didn't you come through when I thought you were going to come through? You obviously are a liar. You obviously aren't who you say you are. And I am never going to let myself be put in a position again to let me get hurt. If you adopt that mentality, it's going to be really hard to receive from him ever again. And so what if today is the day when that disappointment and that frustration and that hurt just gets released back to him? And the cool thing is, he can take it. You can be as honest as you can. I don't understand why this didn't happen, God. Do you know know how hurt I was? Do you know how the, 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 the wounds from that thing still linger? But if we remember the first part, that he's our shepherd, if we remember the first part, that we are his children, if we remember the gospel that Jesus has paid for us to be before him, he can take care of it. But will you release it? Will you release forgiveness to the people that have have hurt you? We can let, it says so right, right here, do not let your hearts be hardened when things don't go the way you think they should have. It will cause us 
to be the people that say, this is what I believe and this is what I'm gonna act out. I mean, Christians, let's be honest, a lot of us fall apart as easy as a non-believer. I I think you preached a a series one time when I was still here on like um, Christian atheists or something like that. It's like Christians who talk and say God's real and he's got them, but then when anything goes wrong, it's like your whole world falls apart. Instead of actually going, no, God's got me. Like, everything in my life is telling me this, but there is an X factor called the gospel that changes everything. We forget that, and then we live in defeat, and we are just as full of fear as everybody else, and we wonder why we're not getting any traction in life or our walk with God. It's because we've let our hearts get hardened. I have to... Guard my heart. It says guard your heart for out of it flow the the springs of life. It wouldn't say guard your heart if there was nothing that would come after your heart. There are things that are trying to harden you to God. There are lies the enemy would love for you to believe to harden your heart and to not guard your heart. But God says guard it. And you guard it with the knowledge of the gospel. That's how you guard your heart. You remind yourself over and over and over again of who Jesus is and who he's paid for you to be and his love for you and his faithfulness to you and his ability to bring water out of a rock in your life. There's nothing that you're facing that is hopeless. There's a a guy I really... I love to quote, his name is Steve Backlin, and he says, there's no hopeless situations, there's just hopeless people. Because we have God. And so the last thing I'm, I, I took out of Psalms 95, it says in verse nine, though they had seen my work, they put him to the test Though they had already seen God show up faithfully over and over and over again. You got to remember, these are the people that saw 10 plagues free them from Egypt. These are the same people that saw God split the Red Sea and and they walked through it. These are the people that had the experience. It wasn't even just a story to them. It was the experience of having walls of water walking through while being chased by an army and God delivers them. And he says, the reason their hearts were hardened and the reason that they were quarreling with God because uh, Meribah means quarreling was because they forgot again who had already delivered them time and time and time and time again. So go, if you will, we're all over the Bible today. Come on. (laughs) Psalms chapter 78 talks about the importance of remembering. It's important to remember your history with God. It's important to remember every little time you hear him, he moves in your life because it builds a monument to who he is. And so Psalms chapter 78, we're gonna read five to 11. It says, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, And arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites armed with the bow turned back on the day of battle. 
They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law, for they forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. Two things to take out of that. One, children's ministry. Teach your children the history that you have with God because it will give them an ability and a foundation to hope in him for themselves. This is a generational thing because your victories are passed down to your children. So don't keep them quiet, but look for every opportunity to point out the works of God, even if it's not in your life. We should be giving testimonies to our kids. Did you know, Mr. Jones, he just got healed because God still heals. It says they taught their children so that they would hope in God. And then back to my original point in verse 9, it says the Ephraimites were armed with a bow, but they turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, refused to walk according to his law, for they forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. See, we're all in a battle. We all get to places where we are at Meribah, where we are looking at needs and battles, and there seems to be nothing but a desert and a rock. And if you forget that God is who he says he is, and all the things he's already brought you through, all you will see is a rock. But if you can remember the times he's delivered you, he's answered your prayers, he's blessed you, he's let you experience his love and his presence, then when you don't see just the rock, you see God who can take water out of a rock. You can walk through any situation and have hope because you're looking at the one who does the miraculous. This is the God we serve. This is the God we sing about. This is the God we talk about. It's time we actually live like it's true. When my life has no answers and I am scared, legitimately scared, I don't know what's going to happen, I have a foundation that he is God. Your foundation, if you have given God permission to come into your life and make you new, you have the same foundation. Don't forget. Don't forget in the middle of your battle. It says that they had bows. They were equipped for the battle they had, but they ran. You are equipped for the battles you're fighting. Right now, you are equipped for the battle you're fighting. You have to remember. This is a day of remembrance. This is a day to put your shoulders back and fight. I started out a little slow, but I'm feeling it now. There is an epidemic in the church of kids walking away from God. They get out of youth group and they're gone. I can give you a list. We have to help them remember. We have to remind them of the breakthroughs that they've seen. There are kids I know I've seen operate in deep spiritual gifting. And right now they're away. But we pray, God, you're going to finish what you started. This isn't the time to get, to get like so depressed and sad and like, oh, the enemy's so big. Compared to God, he is nothing. Compared to God, he is nothing. We are equipped. If you're here today and you have a loved one who's not following God, you're equipped to follow God into helping them find him back. That may be you stop talking to them about God because you've been hounding them for the last eight years and you actually just trust him to do something. Or maybe he says, hey, give them a Bible. This is where partnership comes in. We have to remember. We need to be You know, it says we're salt and light in the earth, right? You can't be salt in the light and have the exact same response as the world to the things of this world. Because then you're not being salt or light. You're being exactly like everyone else. But if you can face things with hope and joy and actual uh, expectation and excitement, 
that makes no sense to anybody, you're going to be salt and light. I remember going through a thing one time, and I was talking to somebody about it who didn't know me or didn't know God, and they said, how are you going through this and you're not, you're not going nuts? Like, how? They're like, I, I don't understand how you are not completely freaked out right now because I'd, I would be losing my mind. And I got to say, it's because I'm trusting God with this. Because Jesus has promised to take care of me, and I know that there's no way out of this in the natural, and I know that it is just a big wall of confusion, but I believe him. He gave me promises. He was going to deliver me. He gave me scriptures to stand on, and so I have to actually put action to my belief and stand. Sometimes the greatest action your breakthrough needs is for you to stand. Go, I I don't know what to do. Man, I don't have the answers. God does. And so, you know what I'm going to do while I wait? I'm going to praise him. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to remind myself of everything he's ever done for me. And I'm going to declare not my situation and how dire it is and how dark it is, but I am going to declare that my God is true, that he's real, and that his promises are yes and amen, and they are going to come to pass. There is something about waiting in worship that lifts the weight off and actually gives you momentum to move forward. You stand in front of that rock, all you see is desert. You're like, I am dying. Literally, I'm dying of thirst. My kids, you gave me these kids to take care of, and I don't have what I need to take care of them. God, you can go one of two ways in that situation. You're either going to get mad and you're going to go, I should never have come here. Did, Did you bring me here to kill me? Are you here or not? That, that quote in the first original story killed me. It's like, is God with us or not? I'm like, I feel that. I've said that. That is not foreign to me. But the choice comes, are you going to say, are you here or not? And I think we've all said it, and if you do, bounce back from it. God's not mad at you, and he understands. So if that's how you feel, be like, I don't feel like you're here. But the basis that you should come back to is, I worship you. I worship you, God. I am not worshiping you because I see anything. I'm worshiping you because I believe you. It says very clearly in scripture, we're to walk by faith, not by sight. I think it's time for the church to actually pull that trigger. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Walk by faith. We are called to be salt and light. We are not called to fall apart. We are not called to turn back and run. We are not called to harden our hearts and walk away. We are called to stand and look not at the situation, which will just reinforce what you're already saying, but look up. Look up. Because on top of, like I said, the Red Sea and all this, these people literally had a cloud by day and a fire by night. Look up. It was the cloud and the fire that actually brought them to that wall. And so if he brought you here, he's going to get you through it. He didn't bring you to the desert to die. Make this personal. I'm using this as the analogy, but this is like, actually, close your eyes. I want you to think. I think we've all got situations in life that this would apply to. He didn't bring you here to die. And I will put in a Let's not warp our theology on it. But nonetheless, 
He's with you as you look at your impossible situations. He's with you as you have no answers, no plans, no ideas. He can bring water out of a rock. He can answer those prayers. He can meet those needs in ways you've never even considered or dreamt of. So what if we take the boxes off of our thinking today of it has to look like this, it has to be in this amount of time, and it has to come the way I want it to. What if we actually took control off of our lives and said, God, I trust you. I think a lot of us would get a lot more momentum in our breakthroughs if we took our hands off of control. But that, to be honest, requires faith. It requires vulnerability. It requires risk. But that's who you're called to be. You're a man of faith. You're a woman of faith. And part of that is releasing it. Part of that is going, God, I don't know what to do with this, but you do. And while I wait, I'm just going to declare your faithfulness over it. I'm going to declare the prophetic words you've spoken to me. I'm going to declare the promises that I see in the word. I'm going to declare the faithfulness of the testimony of God over my life. And I know that you didn't bring me here to die. That there is hope for change, for shift, for breakthrough. And before I see it, I am going to worship you. To do that requires release. Because if you hold on to your frustrations and your offenses and your fears, it's really hard to go like that. The great news is we are called and we are marked to bring the kingdom of God. And that includes in your own personal life. You have the right to see the kingdom of God explode in your family. You have the right to see the kingdom of God bring deliverance and hope to your friends, your family, to see your workplace change, to see your finances taken care of, to see peace and healing come to your own heart. It's our inheritance. Jesus didn't pay for it so we could look at it on a shelf and sing about it. I want that thing active every day. There's hope. (laughs) Listen, everybody stand up real quick. This is so youth groupy, but I don't care. I want you to think about your situation. Ready? Now I want you to smile, even though, and listen, listen. I am not diminishing the pain or the hurt at all. I'm asking you to lift your eyes up. That's what I'm asking you to do. Please don't misinterpret this for anything other than what it is, okay? I want you to think about that thing. I want you to think about the hope that you have, and I want you to go like this. Stupid, but I don't care. Because it's going to show that there's something changing on the inside. There's something prophetic about in the face of this thing that's been haunting you to go, I'm good. (laughs) Ready? One, two, three. There you go. There's hope. There's excitement. So worship team, can you come up? Christianity is supposed to be fun, believe it or not. And it doesn't mean it's only fun when everything looks the way it's supposed to. That's where faith comes in. That's where hope comes in. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to turn it over to Maconula. All right, please bow your heads. 
Father, God, I pray that we would be a people who live out our faith. We would be a people whose responses to the situations of life look like faith. That God, you would give us strength and courage to raise our eyes above our Meribah, above a rock in a wilderness where there's no hope, that we would lift our eyes up to see the cloud and the fire because you're still here. You haven't left us. We're not abandoned. We're not hopeless. You are with us, and therefore, God, life is with us. Hope and breakthrough are with us. Expectation is with us. We are not a defeated people. We are called to be victorious and triumphant because the victorious and triumphant one literally lives inside of us. God, raise our perspective that we would fight and not turn back. That we would recognize that you have given us everything we need to win. And finally, Lord, I ask that we would remove our boxes and our control of what things need to look like and how they have to happen before we'll be at peace. Help us to have peace that passes all understanding as we exalt Jesus, as we see him in his kindness, as we see him in his compassion, as we see him in his care and concern and gentleness. And I'm reminded of a psalm, I don't know where it is, but it says, your gentleness makes me great. Picture the gentleness of the Lord coming over your situation. And seeing him lead you through it with greatness. God, we honor you and we thank you that you're shifting your people to be salt and light like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And if you liked what you heard today, please consider donating. You can support C3 by clicking the giving button on our homepage at cccsc.org or by texting CCCSC to 833-257-5698. Thanks again. Have a great day, and remember, God has a great plan for your life.